Welcome to the Epigenetics Podcast from Active Motif. Join host Dr. Stefan Dillinger for lively discussions with leading epigenetics researchers. Hear about their past experiments, what they're working on now, and what's coming next. You know their papers, now get to know them and discover the stories behind the science. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Epigenetics Podcast. Today I'm happy to welcome Sarah Marazi from the UK Dementia Research Institute at Imperial College London on this show. Please let me briefly introduce you to the audience. You got your PhD from King's College London in 2017. After that, you moved on to, tour, to do a postdoc at Queen Mary University of London. Then in 2019, you became honorary senior lecturer at Imperial College London. And since 2023, you are senior lecturer and UK DRI group leader at King's College London. A question I like to ask every guest to start off our little podcast is, how did you become interested in biology in the first place and then in pursuing a career in science? Oh, well, so for me, it's slightly different because my background is actually in mathematics originally. And uh, in my early undergrad days, I thought I'd become a pure mathematician and work on such wonderful things as algebraic geometry and topology. Um, but I, I realized throughout that degree that um, it was a bit too abstract and too isolated for me. As a mathematician, you basically work on your own, essentially, even at professorial level. Um, and I also felt like I would like to apply my skills to something that is meaningful to me. Um, and so I uh, ended up writing my master's thesis uh, on epidemiology and biostatistics, medical statistics. Um, and as I then was looking for PhD projects, found one really exciting one at King's College London with um, John Mill on epigenetic analyses of brain-related diseases. Um, and I had a particular interest in the brain. I'd also done a second undergrad in psychology. Um, so it sounded really exciting. Um, they were generating these big data sets of DNA methylation data uh, across various time periods in human development uh, and different conditions, including uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and dementias in the late age, but also an interest in what happens Uh, in the early life, as we're exposed to various different stressors, psychologically um, or more physically. Um, and basically, I came in as someone who was predisposed, I guess, to analyze these big data sets, high dimensional data, um, advanced statistical modeling. Um, and yeah, then then really found my passion in that realm. And, and as I was doing the PhD, um, that's when the realization came. This is what I want to keep doing for the rest of my career. Yeah, let's let's just dive in straight into your science that centers around, as you said, epigenetic regulation in neurodegenerative diseases. At the start of your career, you were part of a study where you investigated severe psychosocial deprivation in early childhood. So what does this actually mean? And what did you find about the connection between this and epigenetics? Right. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of theories around stress of uh, various types, um, leaving long-term imprints in our body in some way. And there is really good epidemiological evidence that um, people exposed to severe stress will later on develop psychiatric, psychological issues, but sometimes also more somatic diseases. And this is particularly true if they experience this in early childhood, because it's a particularly plastic developmental period. Um, however, it's not known what the biological substrate um, of this memory is in our body. And so there's been a lot of excitement, some might say hype around the epigenome um, as the memory that retains uh, these uh, signatures of stress exposure and then later on leads to adverse psychological and health outcomes. So the study that you mentioned um, was a really fascinating cohort of uh, children adopted from Romanian orphanages. Uh, so in the 1980s, under the Ceausescu uh, regime in Romania, um, there was a huge increase uh, in population, partially because uh, abortion was outlawed and, and contraception was made really difficult. And there was a push to, to grow the country, but there were, the economic means were not there. So a lot of children, unfortunately, were given into institutions that were very poorly funded and poorly run. 
Um, so these children were exposed to things like um, um, malnutrition, uh, neglect, basically uh, no adults to really interact uh, and take care of them, uh, no stimulation, both emotionally and uh, cognitively, um, poor hygiene, and sometimes even active um, abuse uh, and maltreatment. And so um, in, in the 1990s, uh, this made the news across the world. And from several countries in Europe, uh, there was a big push to adopt the children. Uh, and uh, Sir Michael Rutter at the time, he was a psychiatrist at King's College London, set up the English and Romanian adoption study where he uh, recruited some of these children that were adopted into the UK into a longitudinal study to um, understand future development for children that were growing, growing up under such severe, um, uh, poor conditions. And so they recruited some um, control UK, within UK adoptees as well. But then also even within um, the Romanian cohort, the children would have been exposed to different periods uh, of time to these, um, yeah, to the institutional deprivation. And so in that context, we studied uh, DNA methylation uh, of some of these adoptees. Um, and this was saliva, uh, but the buckle swap DNA methylation um, to see whether we could pick up any signatures of a duration of exposure versus um, differential DNA methylation. So if you're exposed for a really long time, then you're predisposed to adverse future outcomes as well. And the cutover seems to be sort of uh, 18 months where it gets much worse. So if children are adopted before the age of 18 months, they'll, they'll probably catch up fine afterwards. But if they spend longer than that in the orphanage, um, a lot of them will have long-term adverse outcomes. And so we found um, some some differential DNA methylation, but one, one in particular that spanned a whole region of one of the cytochrome genes um, cype 2 e one and this is a gene uh, involved in, well, metabolizing various different things, um, it has, including, I think, um, alcohol and, and some other uh, medications and compounds. Um, but that's also been associated uh, with, with depression and antidepressant use in the past, so that was quite interesting. And so in our study, we found that children exposed uh, longer um, to the institutional deprivation show differential methylation across this region and equally symptoms of um, what we would call um, quasi-autism, which is basically an inability to read uh, emotional, uh, emotionally understand other people and infer what they intend to do, um, was also associated with a differential uh, methylation above and beyond what was just explained uh, by, by the deprivation exposure so potentially as a mediator of that effect so this was like a whole bunch of actions applied to the kids right it's not like a single isolated um right. thing that you were looking at but it's like a whole bunch of actions right. um here that's correct and we and and it's probably one of the most severe exposures all around that that you would get in a in a natural context so what you then did is indeed looking at like a single thing i mean it's it's not like a single thing because it's the whole diet but you looked also at early life diet and how this would um, affect um like the epigenetics later on um so how what did you see there <laughs> so that that was very different this was then uh, during my postdoc um and that was at queen mary university working uh, in the lab of waldman rakian and so um Before I even joined, they had shown that in the mouse, um, protein restriction diet uh, can cause basically uh, can cause epigenetic changes, but also potentially something interesting going on uh, with regulation of ribosomal DNA. So really, uh, I spent two years uh, in depth investigating uh, the part of the genome that encodes uh, the ribosomal RNAs. And this is one of the most difficult parts of the genome to study because, in fact, when we were doing it, it, the clusters hadn't even been mapped out. So ribosomal DNA basically occurs, uh, is, is encoded in a 45 kilobase 
region that occurs in repeat clusters. And each cluster can have up to 100 copies or so of this 45 kilobase repeat. Um, and humans uh, have our, our DNA clusters on five different chromosomes. So all the acrocentic ones, the one with one really short arm, um, have I'm these our DNA clusters. That make up the nucleoli. Sorry? That make up the nucleoli. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They are um, they are the nucleolar associated regions, um, uh, so they they are in very specific compartments. And um, we know uh, if we map, say, DNA from the ribosomal regions to a consensus ribosomal unit, we can see that there is clearly genetic variation occurring uh, across the ribosomal DNA. Although within the RNAs, it's quite limited. Um, it's relatively conserved. There are some variants that are in the coding regions, uh, but then you have this uh, intergenic spacer that's in, in the region and that there is a lot of uh, genetic variation in there. And it's not entirely clear um, what the function of that is. Um, but, but it seems to be that some copies of uh, our DNA are expressed, others not, and that there are dynamic mechanisms um, in particular, uh, in response to nutrition and metabolism that can regulate how much RDNA and which copies of RDNA um, we use. And, and that, again, um, will involve DNA methylation. So there's a really uh, complex interplay. And, th and that's what we saw in those studies that depending on um, maternal, uh, well, early life nutrition, protein restriction, um, the mouse will respond differentially to it. And then it turns out, actually, there's a whole genome-wide context as well. So this this seems to differ between different mouse species as well, um, depending uh, on on the length and how many copies they have to begin with. Um, and, and that will influence the plasticity. So you just mentioned that all those early life influences on uh, on, 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 yeah, on the childhood, um, they reflect in the DNA methylation. Um, well, that's one of the theories. <laughs> that's that's right. Is there um, also might be, like um, histone modifications that might be involved? Well, I mean, I would argue probably yes, um, because I think chromatin and histone modifications often represent maybe a more direct uh, response uh, to gene regulation. Uh, that we can pick up. I think the reason why it hasn't been done or hasn't been shown as much is that it's harder to study and more expensive to study. So um, a lot of the work that's going on in these big epidemiological population cohorts will use DNA methylation because um, it's easy to extract DNA and run DNA methylation arrays, and it can be done pretty high throughput. Um, whereas I think Uh, with histone modifications, um, you need a better lab setup. There is not as much of a service going on. Uh, it costs more money. And so I think histone modifications are beginning uh, to be looked at in epidemiological contexts, but more for tissue and cell type specific things. So I know several groups that, as we are now, are working on the brain for various both psychiatric and neurological conditions. Um, and there we've been... Um, Yeah, there have been some really, really interesting findings uh, with uh, epigenetic annotations. And I think one of the most striking things is that we consistently see that genetic risk for a lot of complex diseases, specifically brain diseases, neurological diseases, is quite um, specifically enriched in regulatory elements and particularly enhances. So really, if we want to understand what these non-coding genetic risk variants are doing, We need to be studying the enhancers. We need to be studying um, the histone modification code and the annotation. We need to understand um, what what cell type is a given variant active in. So if it's an enhancer, where is this enhancer active? Uh, which target gene does it regulate downstream and into which sort of bigger picture networks and pathways does it fall? Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is very complex indeed and, and needs... I mean, ATAC-seq is maybe a good method to start with uh, which is also comparatively easy uh, uh, when uh, in comparison to histone ptms and dna methylation on the other side but yeah um it's very complex um you then switched gears a little bit in, into uh, investigating neurodegenerative diseases in the first paper from nature neuroscience uh, you looked at h3k27 acetylation in alzheimer's in a hosting histone acetylone white association study complicated word. So how did it come that you moved into the topic of neurodegenerative diseases and what did you find in the study? Um, 
actually that that had been sort of uh, my my passion and what I had wanted to do since the beginning of my PhD. So when I set out, my PhD wasn't planned through into the last detail and all the project set up. Um, but we talked vaguely about some brain related phenotypes, um, epigenetics and uh, epigenetic signatures from brain samples, ideally. Um, and so I'd really been wanting to do an Alzheimer's study the whole time. And ever since I started and I, I was going to these conferences, re reading literature, I was really interested in histone modifications uh, because, like I said, they seem to link more directly to gene expression. And I was surprised that nobody had looked at them really in the context of diseases because it's challenging. Um, and so my lab had already done a big DNA methylation study of Alzheimer's disease and found some really interesting um, differentially methylated sites in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. And I basically said, why don't we do this with histone modifications? Um, and so the idea was there since the onset of my PhD, but it took some time to develop and find the right collaborators. Um, and so uh, we we nailed down on H3K27 acetyl because it is very interpretable. Uh, when you have increased acetylation and enhancers and promoters, that means uh, increased expression. It is pretty much exclusively found at promoters and enhancers. So these are quite clear and well-known regulatory elements. And so that's the one we went with. And I found a collaborator who was very experienced in, in ChIP-seq uh, experiments at the time and helped me optimize this. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so we ran this study and it was actually my very first time doing lab work, mm -hmm. <laughs> having come in as a mathematician. And in retrospect, now that I run a, a lab that does both experimental and computational work, I am kind of shocked uh, how little went wrong in that project <laughs> and how smoothly it all went through. But I, I put it all down to my excellent collaborator who was very experienced and taught me very well. Um, uh, and then uh, analyzed this data and actually saw that uh, there was really widespread dysregulation and changes in acetylation, much wider than anything that had been seen at the DNA methylation level. So we saw thousands of regions that show differences between the um, Alzheimer's cases and controls. And some of those, quite interestingly, were linked to um, Alzheimer's risk genes, but even familial Alzheimer's risk genes. So Alzheimer's basically occurs in two forms, familial, which is maybe um, 5 to 10% of cases, uh, in which case you harbor a mutation in one of three genes. Um, and that's uh, either APP or the two presenilin genes, presenilin 1 and 2. And if you have such a mutation, you will develop Alzheimer's disease and you will develop a form that's earlier onset. So you're likely to get the disease maybe in your 50s rather than uh, late 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but that accounts for a smaller proportion of cases. Most people get uh, what is called late onset Alzheimer's disease and they're are genetic con contributions to that, but it's not as simple as one mutation, you get the disease, but it's thought to be more of a polygenic disease um, that also acts in combination with environmental risk factors. So all of our cases were late onset cases, no mutations, and yet we saw epigenetic dysregulation uh, in these same genes that normally harbor the mutations uh, associated with familial Alzheimer's. So um, we thought that was uh, quite striking and interesting and uh, suggested maybe to some degree that uh, an epigenetic insult to those same genes uh, can lead to a later onset um, form of the disease. Which would open therapeutic um, possibilities, right? Potentially, yeah. But I mean, at this stage, these yeah. are all association studies and there are a number of caveats to consider. For example, you're always sampling the, the very late stage of disease at w because these are brains from, from brain banks, post-mortem samples. Um, so they're collected when the person dies, um, which usually means they're at a very late stage of the disease. So what we're picking up is going to be a combination of maybe causal factors that are driving the disease molecularly, but also a lot of responses to disease. And we know that there are a number of things going on uh, in the late stage Alzheimer's brain, including quite severe neuroinflammation, and that's going to have an impact mm. uh, on your brain epigenome as well. So you just mentioned that in this study you used CHIP, but you also right. dived into the topic of cotton tag. 
um, and you compare the amount of peaks that it is able to recover compared to ENCODE ChIP-seq. Um, this paper is still a preprint, but it's specifically interesting because on this podcast, we from time to time also dive into the details of new methods and also get a bit philosophical when it comes to things like what is a peak and things like that. So maybe we can spend some time diving into this. So what was your experimental approach and optimizations you made to tackle this analysis? Right. So, um, I mean, maybe let me motivate it. I'm, I'm sort of, my approach to uh, this work is quite pragmatic. I wanted the best possible way to do cut and tag uh, for samples that we'd been collecting. And so we'd been working with a um, complex Zeno transplantation model where you basically put human immune cells in a mouse brain and then we can only collect a limited number of these cells um, when the experiment is done. And so uh, it was obvious for us that cut and tag sounded like the, uh, the right method and, and is definitely the right method going forward um, to profile uh, those limited numbers of nuclei. But uh, we wanted to do it well and we wanted to find the best way to do it. And actually, most of the literature at that point had been published on um, methylated histone modification, so mono or trimethyl um, uh, histone modifications. And so with the acetylation, um, it was a bit trickier. And some of the feedback we got from some other labs that we talked to uh, was basically saying, hmm, maybe the cut and tag signature for acetylation is a little bit noisier than, than the one that we would get for, say, uh, H3K27 trimethyl or H3K4 trimethyl. Um, and so, yeah, so we went through a number of um, experimental and, and computational optimizations. So experimentally, we first of all tried a bunch of different antibodies, antibody concentrations. Um, we did different numbers of PCR cycles. Uh, we tried uh, including different uh, more stronger and weaker HDAC inhibitors just to make sure that, that yeah, the activity uh, of those deacetylases um, is not limiting or, or influencing uh, our outputs. And then we also did some um, different um, DNA extraction methods, so either column or SDS-based. Um, overall, most of the factors didn't make a huge impact. Uh, for example, the HDEX, and that was my previous experience with CHIP as well. I like It was something we were worried about in the beginning with our any samples, or in our case, the post-mortem brain samples, but at that, maybe those samples are, when they're frozen down and dead, the, the deacetylase doesn't seem to be doing much anymore. Um, so, yeah, so we came down to to some conditions uh, that we, in, in basically qPCR-based optimizations, saw as the optimal ones, and then went ahead with uh, sequencing a whole bunch of these libraries um, and doing some computational optimizations as well, because, um, of course, cut and tag was relatively novel. Um, traditionally, for chip seek, people would use Max2 as a peak caller. Um, but then there are a number of new peak callers published. So at the time when we started this project, uh, one called uh, Seeker. But there have been even <laughs> newer ones since then that are specifically targeted um, at cut and tag or cut and tag and cut and run because they have a different signal to noise ratio. And so um, you need probably need a different uh, mathematical model or um, background to identify what is enriched and what is a real peak. Yeah, and so, so sorry to so interrupt we, you because yeah. uh, right now you're talking about like optimizations in the protocol, but what about optimizations in the sample prep? So what did you use at the beginning? Um, how many cells? Uh, what did you do to them? Right. And how can this be optimized? Um, so we didn't, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. We were working with K562 cells at the time because we wanted something where we have a lot of published data that we can compare to, uh, such as ENCODE data. Um, and we were working with plenty of material because we wanted to start from the uh best case scenario. In fact, I think we probably started with maybe too much material. <laughs> we started with 500,000 cells um, in those experiments, which we, um, for our own purposes, now that we're running experiments, we wouldn't do anymore. Um, so uh, when we do this in the lab now, we're probably on 50 to 100,000 um, cells or nuclei. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, what was your other question? 
That was it. Uh, so what did you do in the separate yeah. prep steps and, and, yeah. and what did you do to leading up to the experiment? I mean, if you're using K562 size, then I mean, it's basically straightforward. So <laughs> Exactly. So we thought one step at a time, let's start yeah. with an easy material and then we'll deal with um, lower quality materials such as post-mortem tissue when we get there. Mm. So yeah, you stopped at the peak calling and the bench benchmarking of cut and take against Enco Chipseek. Right. And so there was an interesting um, outcome from this, which is that overall, as we turned the data around and we even used some of the original um, published data from Steve Handikov's lab, who developed uh, the method, obviously, that there is never a perfect overlap between the ENCODE ChIP-seq um, and the cut and tag. And I guess Maybe that's not to be expected. I mean, in an ideal world, uh, the techniques would be completely replaceable and give us the ground truth of where the histone modification binds. But um, yeah, I mean, that's obviously technically not the case because the techniques are different. You have the um, the cross-linking step in the chip that might might be changing things uh, and changing the epitopes and then the binding of the antibody. Um, you have more background noise. Um, so... I guess you wouldn't expect a perfect overlap, but in a way we were a little bit surprised by how low the overlap was. So in our best conditions, it was maybe just over 50%. Um, we have recently done some more experiments and uh, replicate, basically done each of the conditions in triplicate just to be like tr super sure and in new hands and separate experiments. So we, I think our best overlap is now at 60%. But it doesn't really get higher than that. And there's a trade-off, a natural trade-off between how many of the ENCODE peaks uh, that were called in ENCODE are you recapturing in your new data set versus how many extra, if you will, spurious peaks are you including? I mean, because you can play around with the peak calling parameters, especially uh, with this peak caller seeker, you can make it more lenient. You'll call more peaks, then you'll capture more of the ENCODE peaks, but you'll also capture more extra things. Um, so that's a bit of a, uh, yeah, a challenge. And, and what we've tried to do in our work is try and basically threshold it as, um, we want maximum 20% of extra spurious peaks, then how much of ENCODE can we uh, recapture? But again, I mean, Just because they're not in ENCODE and they're in cut and tag, does that mean they're spurious? You you said um, you have had previously quite philosophical uh, discussions about what's real and what's the biology. Uh, we've been having these discussions in the lab for years, and we were thinking about what are the methods that we could use. We thought about looking at luciferase assay data, but that's very confined to specific regions. We want we would like a genome-wide metric, if you will. Um, we were looking at some star seed data, but again, that's limited and that only captures uh, some regions. Overall, I mean, the overall message is basically, even though the overlap is not perfect, uh, when you look at things like um, what transcription factor binding motifs are enriched and how correlated are the samples, they do overall seem to be picking up the same things. And importantly, the peaks that are the strongest will be there in both of the techniques, right? Um, so we think biologically meaningfully, you can use both techniques and, and they are equivalent. But when you do make direct comparisons, you need to take into account that each technique is different. So did you also um, look at the peak shape? Did you um, also look at the peak shape? We did <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, generally, uh, the peaks are fine. What we do observe is that the acetylation uh, of the cut and tag is noisier than the methylation. So in the methylation, you get these classic, really quite um, concise peaks with very little background noise. That's never quite as concise in the ac acetylation. Um, and then the overall signals where the peaks will be called, Seeker will tend to combine multiple peaks into one. Um, so we will take signals from what Max2 would call as a set of separate peaks that are very close to each other, and it'll read it as one peak. Even though when you look at the track, you see there are different individual and geographically separated peaks, if you will. Um, and actually, uh, with uh, we're just generating a, a very large um, Alzheimer's study again uh, from purified brain cell types where we'll have... Um, 
200 samples almost for each cell type. Um, and one of the things we're noticing, the problems exacerbate it the more samples you add. So one of the things uh, we've been doing traditionally is when we call pe peaks um, for ChIP-seq data, we combine samples together because it improves your power to detect the signal over noise. Now, when you do this with cut and tag data and you combine, say, 30, 40 samples together and then you use Seeker to call peaks, um, it becomes almost absurd because it starts calling these peaks that are a mega base long or something like that. It calls very, very few enormous peaks. So clearly um, the, that method isn't well adapted for using this approach of combining samples together, but mm -hmm. was devised for calling on individual samples only. Um, so, so, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, so we're currently thinking about um, how can we best uh, leverage, and, and we might in fact actually go back to Max 2 because of that for these um, scenarios where, where we would like to combine multiple samples together. Because if you have 200 samples, you're interested in what's the overall set of peaks, say, in your first cell types. Say you're looking at neurons. There will be an overall uh, number of maybe 100,000 or so peaks that you would expect in a ChIP-seq uh, data set that might not be equally strong or there in all the samples, but uh, that are sort of the general peaks. And then you look at for signal differences between the samples and calling them on each sample individually is a very inefficient way of getting to those uh, neuron specific peaks over a large sample. Yeah. So what I was wanted to get at, but you didn't kind you did kind of uh, wiggle around that is when you look at a single peak in chip and in cut and tag, yeah. I have observed that you get like a nice shape peaked in in, in chip, but you maybe get so a, a dip in the middle when you do cut and tag. Have you also seen that? Huh. Um, it's a good question. I'm trying to remember. I, I don't, not sure we've quantified this overall. So what we do usually quantify is this um, um, enrichment around the peak center mm -hmm. or also enrichments around uh, transcription start sides. And there, I think the cut and tag peaks are a bit more concise and I don't think we've seen any uh, dips, but okay. uh, you're catching me out a little bit because <laughs> I cannot confirm 100% that this is something uh, we have seen or not seen in, in, in the cut and tag data. Okay. Do you also see some shifts of the peaks or is it always the, the peak summit at the same place? Across samples? Uh, for, for one peak, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's pretty consistent. Um, we do see... The noise can vary a bit, but the yeah the peaks that are there are very consistent. So overall, it's actually I mean I guess the preprint that we, that we put out uh, caused quite a bit of debate and discussion, um, and it was sort of try to be critical, but not in a negative way. We're excited about this mm. technique and we're using it a lot ourselves. We just want to try and use it in the best possible way. Um, so it's definitely working well in our hands is now what we're saying is you just have to be careful with how you analyze it and how you cross compare maybe different data sets yeah so last question i promise um <laughs> to this uh, so this was uploaded in bioarchive in january 2023 and now is uh march 2024 and it's still not published yes. so what's going on <laughs> that's right so um in fact we submitted it to two different journals um so we always put out the bioarchive first and then we went to review in two journals And uh, yeah, we got some concerns raised that we are addressing uh, experimentally right now, including uh, that we're generating more replicates uh, for each of the conditions that we have. So we're going to have everything in triplicate. Um, uh, in fact, uh, we we had a non-anonymous uh, review by Steve Hanikoff, <laughs> uh, who was a bit worried uh, about uh, some of the metrics on our data. And now, um, so we in fact, over sequence some of the samples a bit, which had to do with our sequence. It's not what we were planning to do, but there was apparently space on those sequencing lines. So our sequencing service ended up giving us sort of 100 million reads or okay. in, in that range for some of the samples, which in turn means you get huge duplication rates. Um, and then it looks like the sample quality is poor and the library complexity is poor. Um, I think the ground truth is somewhere um, in the middle. So when you downsample those, the duplication rates are lower. 
Um, I do think the ones we get now after a few years of experience with a technique uh, are are a bit better overall. And we wouldn't we wouldn't choose to sequence 100 million <laughs> reads per library for a cut and tag experiment. That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, in fact, we'd probably go for 10 million to be in a good space. Or if we want to do like more subtle differential acetylation, maybe 20 million. But yeah. I think there you're already in like very high coverage territory for cut and tag. Mm -hmm. So moving on again to dementia research, uh, you were part of several publications that wrote about machine learning and AI and dementia research. Uh, so the, the uh, one keyword is the demon network. Um, so yes. what is it uh, that those approaches can bring to the table in dementia research? Um, so the demon network is sort of now an international uh, network uh, of uh, scientists working uh, in dementia and using AI machine learning methods, but across a, a whole range of different uh, subdisciplines. So um, you have, for example, people who work on imaging data, and I think their machine learning approaches have been around for longer and are maybe a little bit more advanced. So using uh, both structural and functional brain imaging data, for example, um, then you have people who wear on such things, uh, work on things as um, wearables and trackers, devices that measure, for example, your heart rate, um, or uh, sleeping data, uh, and then use that to predict disease onset, disease progression, all sorts of different things, um, how, you, how you deal with the treatment. Um, our own work, I guess, is more in the space of the genome, genomics. Um, how can uh, the genome explain disease or how does genetic risk work and how does it mediate intermediate molecular phenotypes such as epigenetic uh, patterns? Um, but also to some degree, um, and this is a paper that I led on, uh, and that's a big, big challenge in the field is how do we translate between different systems in which we model disease to human disease? So because uh, brain diseases are extremely difficult to study in the human uh, and generally you'll only study them with postmortem tissue. So by the time the person has already died. Um, there has been a lot of work going on in model systems, uh, often mouse models of disease that may have genetics, uh, either full genes knocked in or genetic variants that are in the human knocked in, and they recapture some degree of the disease. Um, but actually, drugs that were discovered, if you will, in, in mouse models have a very poor rate of translation to human clinical trials, and often they'll fail in the human trials, even though they work in the mouse models. Um, increasingly now, people are also using in vitro models, so modeling different brain cells or even co-culturing uh, various cells together in the dish. There you have the problem that these cells are often quite embryonic in their nature, so the epigenetic signatures uh, would, of course, uh, represent uh, a much more earlier developmental stage. And we're dealing with diseases of late age, uh, where age is one of the biggest single risk factors. So if you if you look at what contributes, what, what increases your likelihood to get Alzheimer's, for example, age will come out as the biggest risk factor. So um, if you're over 90, you have a 50% chance of having some uh, neuropathology in your brain already. Um, and that increases as you, even more as you age. Um, so how do we model age in vitro or how do we translate between these complex systems. And I think there is um, there is space and hope for um, machine learning, com more complex, uh, nonlinear uh, models that take in a lot of data and learn associations that we might not very simplistically see uh, to come in. So there has been some development. Um, I don't think there <laughs> the it's, it's been uh, solved, certainly for cross-species translation. I think some of the most exciting things we are seeing um, are more around um, analysis of different types of genomics data. For example, uh, a lot of analysis tools for single cell um, sequencing data um, that can uh, generate embeddings of uh, existing data sets. And so if you're uh, generating a new small data set, you can harmonize it and embed it into a much larger data set and thereby um, improve the power of your own data set, uh, the clustering approaches. Um, we've been doing some work uh, and, and with other collaborators as well at predicting things like um, gene expression or uh, epigenetic modifications from the DNA sequence itself. 
and layering uh, cell type specific information onto that as well. So, um, yeah, in that space, I think we've seen, I mean, there have been a bunch of huge models that were published in the last few years, like Informer, the, the, the big uh, gene expression prediction, deep learning model. And then we had Chromoformer for, uh, for the predicting from um, epigenetics to gene expression. So how do different histone modifications interact and how do they drive gene expression. Um, and so I think we're going to keep seeing a lot more of those in the next few years as well. So usually my next question asks you to imagine that you are writing a grant, but <laughs> or writing up a grant proposal. But then uh, before we started this interview, you told me that you're actually writing a grant proposal currently. So what do you, what are you writing into this? Who giving you away my secrets? <laughs> no, uh, not at all. Um, no, so this one is on. So one, it's a collaborative grant, um, and it's about the role of oligodendrocytes, which are a type of glia cell in your brain. They are the cells that myelinate uh, your nerve cells and the axons of your nerve. They're basically like the insulators where the Uh, conduction of electrical signals becomes faster and more reliable thanks to these fatty myelin sheets around um, the axons. And so um, one of the observations that um, my team, for example, has made is that in these Alzheimer's brain, when you look at histone acetylation and the dysregulation, actually the majority of it seems to occur in the oligodendrocytes. Um, and we did this computationally by developing a cell type deconvolution uh, algorithm and could then infer cell type specific dysregulation. This was also more recently shown um, in a, an empirical paper from uh, the labs of Li Wei Tsai and Andreas Fenning, uh, where they purified different nuclei from uh, brains of people with Alzheimer's and controls. And again, Uh, the largest degree of dysregulation is observed in the oligodendrocytes, both in upregulated and downregulated peaks. So that was an interesting observation. Now we have some collaborators who've been studying gene regulatory networks in mouse models, um, so co-expression networks, um, and assigning them cell type specificity as well, and looking for overlaps with um, genome-wide association study patterns for both Alzheimer's but also for aging and longevity. And again, they found that oligodendrocytes seem to carry a lot of um, that genetic risk uh, for, for AD and uh, for longevity as well. And they seem to do so in a kind of collaborative, communicative fashion with the microglia, the immune cells of the brain. So there are some neuroinflammatory, or it's a, some, some people call it um, inflammaging uh, component going on that the oligodendrocytes seem to be interacting with um, both in aging and AD. And so the grant that we're writing is mainly computational because we're already generating a lot of the relevant data for this, but in, uh, it's about teasing apart what is aging specific, what is AD specific, um, what are the um, genetic contributions to this based on uh, statistical genetics approaches uh, integrating with the, the existing GWAS data, but also what are the sporadic contributions uh, beyond that uh, in AD brain and in aging brain. So we're generating these um, aging timelines of epigenetic profiles as well. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And uh, let's see what we can read from, from the studies then in the future. <laughs> so for the last 43 minutes, we have been on a journey through your scientific career. Did we miss something important or would you like to add something? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, well, one of the things, um, I guess your publication uh, record is always a few years behind of what you're actually working on. Um, and now at the UK Dementia Research Institute, where I've been for the past four years or so, first at Imperial and now at King's, um, what another big focus for our group has been environmental risk factors to neurodegenerative diseases, um, and quite specifically for Parkinson's disease, because it's a disease that's less heritable and that likely has greater contribution of environmental risk. And so uh, we've been working on a number of really exciting uh, in vitro and animal models uh, of pesticide exposures, which are a huge risk factor for Parkinson's disease and human epidemiological work and starting to see some very exciting um, epigenetic patterns associated with this. So indicating um, that 
epigenetics and histone modifications might again represent sort of a cellular mem memory of a long-term low-grade chronic exposure to something like a pesticide that can then drive your cells in a quite cell type specific way into more pathogenic uh, states or predispose them to neurodegeneration. Um, and that seems to be an interaction of both the affected neurons that degenerate, which in Parkinson's are the dopaminergic neurons of the Niagara, but also the surrounding glia cells that uh, are in constant communication with the cell and can stress uh, the cell or, or yeah, send out signals um, that make the neurons more vulnerable and are bad for the neurons essentially. So to finish, could you give us a brief summary of your most important finding? I mean, I've put the emphasis more on the cut and tech study now, maybe. But what is your uh, the the or the the most important thing that you would consider the most important thing? I so I think I mean I don't know if it's one finding, but I think um, we've been uh, together with others uh, really showing that um, epigenetic dysregulation, uh, particularly at the chromatin level. Uh, in Alzheimer's is extremely relevant. We know this because the genetic risk for AD is enriched in these regulatory elements, actually in the regulatory elements of microglia, your immune cells. And so we are building a portfolio of research that lets us drill into where exactly in which cell types and which activation states um, these epigenetic changes occur and how they relate back to the genetic background of coding and non-coding variants that are associated with the diseases. And I think, yeah, in that realm, we've yeah made the biggest discoveries so far. So thank you, Sarah, for your time and for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Epigenetics Podcast from Active Motif. We hope you enjoyed it. You can find all the mentioned references in the show notes. Please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your feedback on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or via email at podcast at activemotif.com, and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. For more great epigenetics content, check out the Active Motif blog at activemotif.com forward slash blog. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.